Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this IIJA Broadband Program's public virtual listening session. We will be getting started momentarily. If you need any technical assistance throughout the event, please use the chat function to send a message to the session hosts. Thanks again, and we'll, just, we'll get started in just a moment. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to have you here for our fourth session of our IIJ. A broadband programs public virtual listening series. My name is Andy Burke, and I am the special representative on broadband at NTIA. I'll also be the moderator for today's session. The president believes that our economy cannot fully recover unless everyone can participate, whether it's working from home or filling out an application. Hello, we're experiencing technical difficulties. One moment. or studying for school tests, a connection for every American is essential. Now, before we get started, let's quickly review housekeeping items. First, the presentation, along with the transcript and recording of today's session, will be available on the Broadband USA website within seven days under the events, past events tab. And if at any time you're having technical issues with our platform, please use the chat to send a message to our hosts, or you can send an email to broadbandforall at ntia.gov. Today, we're excited to have so many of you join us, representing a wide array of stakeholder groups, provide input on our enabling middle mile infrastructure program. Our collaboration and your input will be key factors in the success of these programs, and we will open the mic to hear from as many participants as we can. Your constructive feedback is critical to our next steps of designing and implementing these programs. Given our time constraints, however, it may not be possible to hear from everyone who'd like to speak. Well, if we do not get to you, or if you would prefer to provide written comments, please feel free to provide your input on the discussion questions for today by submitting them to the host via the chat box, or you can email them to broadbandforall at ntia.gov at any time. Now with that, let's go over today's agenda. Sarah Blue, a broadband program specialist, will provide a high level overview of NTIA's enabling middle mile infrastructure program and review today's discussion questions. We will then launch the listening session, which I will moderate. I'll provide additional details later. And now to get us started, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Blue. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, as Andy mentioned, I'm Sarah Blue. I am with the um, Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth here at NTIA. And I am going to talk to you today about the Middle Mile Program. Just a quick note, because there's going to be a lot of um, slide reading here and we are all pre-NOFO right now. The purpose of this listening session today is to present the material that's in the legislature. We're trying to organize it in a way that's a little bit more straightforward so that we can help you um, as you think about the types of questions you might have about the program. So I'm going to present this material. First though, I'm going to share a couple of questions that we would like you to keep in mind as you listen to this material. Um, questions that hopefully at the end, when we are when we open up the floor to, to hear your thoughts and questions, we can take down these thoughts that you have and, and take those into account. 
All right, so first, really quickly, here's what we're going to cover today. We are going to, like I said, um, go over a couple of questions for you to keep in mind as you listen to the material. We will go over a quick, brief overview. We will talk about eligible uses and entities for middle mile funds. We will outline the grantee commitments and requirements, talk about prioritization and other relevant requirements for the program. All right, so to kick things off, we're doing this listening session a little bit differently. I wanted to share with you the, the questions that we'd like you to keep in mind as you review or, or listen to the content which I'm about to present. Um, keep these questions in mind and, and use it as a framework at the end when, you, when the floor is opened up to you to share your thoughts, to ask questions of us. So the first question um, that we would like you to keep in mind is what requirements, if any, should NTIA impose on federally funded middle mile projects with respect to the placement of splice points and access to those splice points? Should NTIA impose other requirements regarding the location or locations at which a middle mile grantee must allow interconnection by other providers? The second question that we'd like you to think about is how can the middle mile broadband infrastructure program leverage existing middle mile facilities, access to rights of way, poles, conduits, and other infrastructure and capabilities that are owned, operated, or maintained by traditional and non-traditional providers, such as public and investor-owned utilities, grid operators, co-ops, academic institutions, cloud service providers, and others in order to accelerate the deployment of affordable, accessible, high-speed broadband service to all Americans. And the third question we'd like you to think about is what scalability requirements, if any, should NTIA place on middle mile grant recipients? So with that, I am going to quickly go over the, the program. The official name is Enabling Middle Mile Broadband Infrastructure. There's a billion dollars of funding available. This is a direct competitive grant and it is tech neutral. And finally, the objective of the program is to encourage the expansion and extension of middle mile infrastructure to reduce the cost of connecting unserved and underserved areas and to promote broadband connection resiliency. There are um, funding uses that are established in the legislation that the middle mile grants can be used for the construction improvement or acquisition of middle mile infrastructure and it goes on to say that middle mile infrastructure broadly means any broadband infrastructure that does not connect directly to an end user location including an anchor institution middle mile infrastructure also includes leased dark fiber, backhaul, carrier neutral internet exchange facilities, submarine cable landing stations, subsea cables, transport connectivity to data centers, and other similar services. It also includes wired and private wireless broadband infrastructure, including microwave capacity, radio tower access, and other services or infrastructure for a private wireless network. Entities who might be eligible to apply either individually or through a partnership include a state or political subdivision of a state, a tribal government, a technology company, an electric utility, utility cooperative or public utility district, a PUD. It might be a telecommunications company or a cooperative, a nonprofit foundation, corporation, institution or association, a regional planning council, a native entity, or an economic development authority. The next couple of slides, um, we're going to talk about requirements for applying entities. And so first let's talk about the priorities. In the application, the entity must agree to prioritize connecting middle mile infrastructure to last mile networks who provide or plan to provide broadband services to households in unserved areas. Uh, prioritize also connecting non-contiguous trust lands or 
prioritizing the offering of wholesale broadband service at reasonable rates on a carrier neutral basis. The build time is no more than five years. Um, the complete build out middle mile infrastructure, which is described in the application should be no completed in no later than five years after the grant funds are made available. There will be an extension permitted, of course, of up to a year um, if there are plans for use, if the if there are extenuating circumstances, if the project's already underway. And then finally, accountability is a big, um, it's something to keep in mind because the assistant secretary shall establish sufficient transparency, accountability, reporting and oversight measures and establish build out requirements for each eligible entity that receives a middle mile grant which shall require a completion of a certain percentage of project miles by a certain date and also penalties, which might include the cancellation <laughs> of funds um, for grantees who do not meet the build out requirements. And, and also note here down on the bottom of the screen that the amount of the middle mile grant awarded may not exceed 70% of the total project cost. Other requirements which are established in the legislation are um, that the, the act requires that proposed middle mile broadband projects be capable of supporting retail broadband service. Another requirement is interconnection and non-discrimination um, that those middle mile projects shall offer using fiber optic technology technology, because this is a physical connection, shall offer interconnection in perpetuity where technically feasible and that the interconnection required to be offered includes both the ability to connect to the public internet and the physical interconnection for the exchange of traffic and that the applicant shall disclose the applicant's proposed interconnection, non-discrimination and network management practices in the application to NTIA. And then we have um, connecting anchor institutions that to the extent where it's feasible, the entity um, who is using fiber optic te technology shall ensure that the proposed middle mile network is capable of providing broadband to anchor institutions at a speed of not less than one gigabit per second download and one gigabit per second upload and offer direct interconnection facilities to anchor institutions which are located within 1,000 feet of the middle mile infrastructure. And mapping, one of the requirements established it talks about mapping in that the eligible entity um, building out terrestrial or fixed wireless middle mile infrastructure shall use the most recent data available from one of the following sources. One, the FCC fixed broadband map. Two, the state or the tribal government who has jurisdiction over that area. Or three, speed and usage surveys. Um, additionally, the eligible entity who constructs, improves, or requires middle mile infrastructure using this grant money will share, shall share, um, the location of that infrastructure with the assistant secretary, the commission, the tribal tribal government with jurisdiction over the area if applicable and the state broadband office for the state where the area being served is located. This information will, the assistant secretary will determine what a uniform format in order to submit this information shall be. And also know that this information is only being used for the purposes of carrying out the grant program and any related reporting. Now we will talk about prioritization. Um, in awarding middle mile grants, the assistant secretary should give priority to projects that leverage existing rights of way, assets and infrastructure in order to minimize financial, regulatory and permitting challenges. To projects in which the eligible entity designs the route of middle mile infrastructure to enable connection of unserved anchor institutions including tribal anchor institutions. Two projects that facilitate the development of carrier neutral interconnection facilities. 
and projects which improve the redundancy and resiliency of existing middle mile infrastructure and also reduce regulatory and permitting barriers in order to promote the construction of new middle mile infrastructure. There's a lot which should be given priority. The assistant secretary shall give priority to applications from eligible entities meeting at least two of the next five conditions. First, that is those applications which adopt fiscally sustainable middle mile strategies to those who commit to offering non-discriminatory interconnect to terrestrial and wireless last mile broadband providers and anybody else making a bona fide request. Three, those applications which identify specific terrestrial and wireless last mile broadband providers who have expressed written interest in interconnecting with middle mile planned and demonstrated a sustainable business plan or adequate funding sources with respect to the interconnect. Four, the eligible entity has identified supplemental invest investments or in-kind support, which might accelerate completion of the plan project. Or five, the eligible entity demonstrates that the infrastructure will benefit the U.S. national security interests. And finally, as it relates to tribal governments, um, the assistant secretary may waive certain requirements if the assistant secretary finds the waiver requirement uh, necessary for the effective delivery and administration of middle mile grants to tribal governments or the construction, improvement, or acquisition of middle mile infrastructure on trust land. And now it is my pleasure to hand back over to Andy, my colleague, who will open up the floor so that we can listen to your questions and thoughts on this content. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna to turn to the moderated portion of this. We want to hear from you. It is really important for you to give critical feedback um, as we work on this program. So if you would like to participate, please make sure that you raise your hand. Uh, of course, in the desktop application, there you can go to reactions and click raise hand. In the phone application, similarly, you can hit on the button and get to the raise hand. And of course, if you are on audio only, hit star nine to raise your hand. So let's get started. Okay, I'm going to um, call on uh, one person and then uh, put another person on deck. So please be ready when I call on you so we can make sure that we maximize the amount of time that, that we have for these. Uh, first, let's hear from Jonathan Baker. And Paul Gee, you are on deck. Thank you, Andy. Can you hear me? This is Jonathan. We can hear you, Jonathan. Great. So uh, I'm from the Vermont uh, Communication Union District uh, organization, and uh, we've had a lot of difficulty when building our municipal broadband networks with pole owning utilities and ISPs using trade secret protections to hide the locations of already built infrastructure, even infrastructure that's been funded wholly or in part with public money. And that would uh, give us a huge cost savings when doing our, our you know, high level and detailed designs if we could uh, sort of see where existing assets uh, have already been built. That would be one of the hugest cost savings for us. And the uh, second comment would be on the FCC maps that are used to determine eligible areas. We see a lot of the incumbent ISPs up here using those to protect their uh, sort of business uh, areas uh, that they have sort of monopolies on from competition. So we'd like to see the ISPs no longer self-report speed data to the FCC and the FCC uh, collect that data directly from the public with some sort of uh, publicly built speed testing tool. Uh, those would be our two uh, suggestions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Now we'll go to Paul and Mary Bauer. You are on deck. 
All right. Thank you very much for the time. I'll be as efficient as possible. You have to understand there are good players and bad players that are seeking this money. The bad players are the ones that created the digital divide. Those are the very same incumbents that are going gunning for this money. And they have written in all the back doors to try to get the money. What you have to understand is the role they've played to date and put them on the sidelines and actually go with the municipal broadband people and be honest and straightforward because these companies are not honest and straightforward. Let's get clear. Public money put all of the fiber in the ground from 1993 to the present. These companies claiming ownership over that is false and illegal. And they are attempting to take that asset and hide it from us. That's wrong. You, the NTIA, should stand up and say, that's it, game over. We're now going to identify everything at all the public conduit, and we're going to make maximum use of it. I talked to a 30-year employee of AT&T who retired last year. We spent two and a half hours. There's lots of dark fiber in the ground. It just was never deployed because strategically they made more money for wireless. It's all there to be used. This middle mile thing isn't as hard as you think it is. A lot of it's already there. You just have to identify it and put it in the public record so we all know where it is and we all have a right to connect to it. Now, what you have to realize is the wireless world irrevocably changed on August 13th of 2021 when the U.S. Courts of Appeal, D.C. Circuit, remanded FCC Order 19126 back to the FCC, leaving the nation with no RF microwave radiation maximum public exposure guideline above 6,000 megahertz. All 6,000 plus megahertz deployments presently operating, there are a lot of them, are now illegal and must be powered off until the FCC completes its court mandated environmental review of the 11,000 plus pages of peer reviewed scientific evidence that the Environmental Health Trust and Children's Health Defense and other plaintiffs placed in the FCC's public record. This is a bell you cannot unring and cannot ignore because we placed it in your public record, the NTIA. You must look at those 11,000 pages of evidence in order to decide who will get this money. And when you do, it isn't true that everything can be technology neutral because one of these technologies actually damages and hurts people. There's your problem. The whole thing must be focused on FTTP, fiber optic to the presence. That's what was promised back in the mid 90s. That's what these companies committed to do. 45 megabits up and 45 megabits down. It's in the contracts that they breached. When they breach those contracts, they lose all claim over all assets. The evidence establishing the truth is in your record. And it doesn't matter what the propaganda says. You know, the propaganda that mainstream media dutifully distributes on behalf of the actual bosses of the FCC, the ones oh, actually Paul, calling Paul, the shots. We have a we have a two minute um, uh, limit. So if you could try to make sure. I that sure will. Have... I'll, 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 I'll and I'll pass it on to Mary Bauer. OK, look for that evidence and understand that the court mandated environmental reviews was issued in 2019 and 20. Therefore, nothing can happen through fixed wireless until that review is completed. I would like to yield to Mary Bauer. Okay, Thank, thanks so much, Paul. I'm gonna, before I turn it over to Mary, I just wanna make sure that I repeat, we have a two minute um, rule. So please try to keep your comments short so we can make sure I see a lot of hands raised and we wanna get to everybody and then uh, if you could make sure that you say um, your name and if you're representing someone who you represent. So with that, I'll send it over to Barry Bauer and we've got Brian O'Hara on deck. Hi, Mary, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? There you go. There you go. Okay, thank you. So my name is Mary Bauer. I represent Virginians for Safe Tech. I also work across the country with other safe tech groups like the one Paul's in, Wired America. So I'm gonna pick up where he left off. And my concern with accountability and transparency is the timing of uh, how NTIA is releasing these funds. There's a lot of lawsuits in the, in the hopper that are going to change the FCC rules, uh, supposedly because of the record of evidence that Paul talked about. And I kind of feel this is going to be another FAA and AMOC debacle where they're claiming six months, everything's going to be fixed. But yet at the same time, they're saying, no, it's more like two years for, you know, the small regional airplanes. And this is kind of how I feel with the traditional carriers. Um, 
serious problems that Paul brought up cannot be addressed or cured in the time NTA has a lot to issue bead funds. So the NTA should only issue the funds for companies committing to install fiber to every home and business, something the well-known com- well incumbents committed to do in the mid nineties, but never did. The contracts called for 45 up and 45 down and the incumbents breached their contracts. Breach of contract means they should pay you back and we should get that wired service that was promised. It's safer. And there are at least three lawsuits in the hopper that talk about the the guidelines being obsolete. And this is clearly omitted from everything that you've put up on the screen here today. So all the safe safe tech groups are watching, you know, what you're doing here with these incumbents and how they upscound it with the money and and cross subsidize and misappropriate it, uh, copper wireline money to 4G wireless networks and According to the regulators lawsuit, you know, stole grandma's landline phone bill phone and charged her a lot of money for something, you know, services that she wasn't even getting. So the 11,000 pages of evidence in NTIA's record conclude that wireless radio frequency microwave radiation is bioactive and is currently being insufficiently regulated by localities that have a duty to preserve its residents, quiet enjoyment of streets, privacy, public safety, and per the TCA Act of 1996, there is a TCA conference report, a document that recommend, recognizes the legislative intent of 1996 was to have those localities protect the people. And that's there's a, a lawsuit he, here, Palos, Palos Virtus versus Abram, Abrams. And in the brevity of time, I'm not going to cite from the report, the 1996 report that talks about the locality's ability to regulate health and safety. and. The propaganda is basically that they're preempted and and they're not and this has to stop so therefore so called okay Harry, we, we we're, we're getting uh we're way over your time too but okay. i want to if you need to to finish up then i'll be happy to do that before we turn it over to brian yeah um in conclusion you know, we're concerned about what you're allowing in front of the homes based on all these lawsuits that are making a record of law and are being totally ignored that's it great thank you so much okay um, thank you I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian O'Hara, and we have Kevin Hamer up next. Well, thank you very much, Brian O'Hara with the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. A very good presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in. Two points I want to make. First, I think, Sarah, and this is in the last bit of the slide, you talked about data, three sets of data. You'd all rely on the FCC maps, state data, and then potentially speed surveys that companies could do. And I think you said that there would be some standards for that. My my uh advice first to say if there's going to be standards by which um speed tests and surveys that would be used to uh, verify service um you know if you're going to set standards let that be known as soon as possible because i know folks that are already starting to look to their areas and find whether they're a service and then uh, on the middle mile i just want to bring up again i know there's been some concerns before that there could be a lot of rural areas that have fiber running through it but they don't serve those communities Right, it may run from one urban area to an urban area through the rural without serving them. So just because there happens to be fiber there does not mean a community is being served in the middle mile context. So just wanted to bring that up and make that point. And thank you for the opportunity. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. I appreciate that, Brian. And now let's go to Kevin Hamer next with Peter Silverman after that. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide my comments. My name is Kevin Hamer, and I'm the uh, general manager of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta Tribal Broadband Consortium. Uh, and in our area of Southwest Alaska, middle mile infrastructure for fiber doesn't exist. The closest opportunity we have for any uh, landing station is uh, hundreds of, of miles away. So we are looking to try and use middle mile infrastructure grant funding to provide um, uh, fiber optic broadband to uh we represent 17 tribes in a, in a 55,000 square mile area of southwest alaska uh fiber optic cable is is going to be a, an answer the long-term answer for us but it also needs to be combined with other uh technologies in order to extend fiber optic across uh, hundreds and thousands of miles of tundra and protected lands um, to reach some of our uh, villages none of whom are connected to each other through roads or other infrastructure. They are, in effect, uh, islands uh, unto themselves. You reach them either by plane, boat, uh, or a frozen river in the winter. Uh, so the, the transportation and the connectivity of, of trenching or even aerial fiber optic uh, 
through these villages is going to take years and years and more money than the billion dollars that's available in this entire program. So taking advantage of um, fiber uh, optic landing stations and building at least some connectivity to some of our villages uh, and then extending that through other means um, is, is I hope you will consider those um, uh, hybrid options uh, that incorporate fiber optic, uh, but provide the most fiber broadband connectivity to the most uh, citizens, uh, tribal citizens that we can uh, throughout our network. Um, and, I, and I would add one more thing in consideration of um, some of the requirements, NTI has done a tremendous job in outreach to uh, tribal uh, tribes and tribal consultation sessions uh, out of the tribal broadband connectivity program. I applaud them for that. Uh, I would hope that there are some consultation opportunities uh, for this middle mile broadband uh, for tribes, specifically geared towards tribes and tribal governments and tribal organizations. Um, and lastly, if I could uh, ask to make sure that uh, uh, NTIA uh, requires tribal consent from tribal governments uh, for carriers that are proposing to operate uh, this broadband um, uh, infrastructure, this middle mile broadband through or on uh, tribal lands or tribal service areas. Uh, that would help ensure that tribal governments are in the loop and, um, and are actually agreeing uh, that these services can be provided on their lands. It requires carriers to deal with, negotiate uh, tribal and, and, uh, and get acceptance and approval from tribal governments uh, for work that is gonna be done on their lands instead of being sort of an afterthought. So appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin, appreciate it. Um, let's go to Peter Silverman and Sachin Gupta is on deck. Uh, thank you. I am Peter Silverman, uh, Director of Legal Operations of Adaptive Spectrum and Signaling Alignment Incorporated, known as ASIA. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm noticing in the comments and also in the presentation the need for meaningful measurement of the need and performance of broadband, the need for enhancements and performance of broadband networks. And uh, I think it's, and it's a small part, and this is a, this, this is one small part of the uh, broadband aspects of the Infrastructure Act. Uh, is NTIA and the, and the FCC jointly together as required by the Act, planning to revisit how measurements are made, how broadly they are done, uh, moving beyond simply self-reporting in order to ensure you know, accurate measurements upon which decisions such as the broadband uh, in middle mile can be made. Uh, there seems to be an opportunity here, given by the Act and given by its very requirements, to address these issues at a deep level and come up with a way that the various parties' interests can be properly presented in the data collected. Uh, these involving broader collection anonymized connect collection of data from large numbers of large numbers of customers, et cetera. Uh, there are many opportunities here, uh, and these can be done both within this particular question being discussed today and the overall requirements of the Broadband Act. Uh, I thank you very much uh, and appreciate the opportunity of speaking. All right, appreciate it. And let's go to Sasha and Stan Santos is on deck. Uh, thank you, can you guys hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, I work for Central Rural Electric Cooperative in Oklahoma uh, that through its subsidiary CentraNet is deploying fiber to the home to all its members. Uh, because we are a small, uh, we are in a small rural area, one of our biggest problem is a lack of competition uh, um, that we get from backhaul operators. So our backhaul costs are quite a bit. And this is not true just for us. It's true for all nine cooperatives that are providing um, fiber to the home in Oklahoma and all 27 cooperatives in Arkansas that are providing fiber to the home. Um, to alleviate this problem of a lack of competition uh, in backhaul networks, um, you know, I'd like to suggest this. Cooperatives connect over 90% of the landmass of the United States. So the public's interest would be best served 
if NTIA prioritizes building middle mile using cooperatives, this would give you two shots with one arrow, right? It'll allow you to use the existing infrastructure in the right of way that the cooperative already owns and has already in place. And it'll also allow um, you to connect the different cooperatives that provide last mile service to their members with each other, thereby creating a much bigger and a much more resilient network. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to Stan Santos. Uh, if you're there with uh, Nathan Gilmore on deck, I, is Stan, are you? Yes, yes. I see. Yes, okay. I'm here, yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Dan Santos, and I'm uh, with Communication Workers of America. I'm also a splicing technician with AT&T. And what I've seen in rural areas has really been an abomination as far as the lack of service and adequate service connectivity. So the middle mile projects that are being proposed are really a lifesaver. But again, I, I'll just reiterate some of the things that other people have said about the lack of uh, data, the lack of accurate data due to self-reporting and also the fact that a lot of their assets are just totally um, not disclosed and held as proprietary information, which I think should be public information. Uh, the other point I would like to make is that I've witnessed undergrounding projects in uh, fire country. Northern California has been ravaged over the last several years. And you know the um, IOUs or the energy companies will go in and I've seen open trenches where they're sitting in um, conduit in order to place cable and you know AT&T telephone poles are sitting right there within about 50 feet and you see this uh, telephone wire zigzagging crossing the streets and going up and down into the uh, communities there while all, everything else is being undergrounded and, and AT&T is just saying well we're just not going to do it it happens with um, Caltrans with uh, major freeway construction and things of that nature where we could be undergrounding that and it could be even just dark fiber but the point is fiber should really be the product of choice or the platform of choice. Um, the money that was given to Elon Musk, a billion dollars for satellite technology, which is totally unproven and which is gonna be another couple of generations uh, before anything can really be done. It's really must money that could have been diverted to fiber and would have gone a lot further. So that would be my, uh, and thank you again. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate your comments. Let's go to Nathan Gilmore next. And after that, we'll go to H. Buddy Robinson. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Um, this is Nathan Gilmore from Dubuque County, Iowa. Uh, I have two or three points that I'd like to work through. Um, Dubuque County is currently designing and with the intention to build a middle mile infrastructure connecting most of the anchor institutions that would be appropriate and then leasing duct out to ISPs. We are fortunate that we do have multiple ISPs that are experienced and are eager to do fiber to the home deployments. The goal is to reduce the cost of entry barriers for them, hence middle mile plus the other benefits of it. Our plan currently, we are looking to use ARPA funds as the start to get this going. But realistically, we're looking at a 13 or 14 year build out. However, if we are allowed to use ARPA funds as our match with this program, we could potentially exponentially reduce that. We could do this in maybe four or five or six years. So I really hope NTIA will allow federal ARPA funds to be used as the match for these grants. It will significantly help some of us that are doing middle mile accelerate that. The other point I would do is I would really encourage NTIA to take a hard look at the state governments that apply for this grant and put counties a higher priority. In our case, our state government has not, what I would say, done very well by the counties. Um, you know, it, 
the state government of Iowa feels Dubuque County is 100% correct. When you look at their maps, we have no need for any broadband investment. Um, so we have gotten none from their CARES. They dumped 300 million into broadband from CARES and Dubuque County has not been able to get any of it because they feel we're okay when we are obviously not okay in any way, shape or form. The final thing I would like to ask is you should be aware that there is a lot of anti dig once policies being developed at the state level. Um, these are being sponsored by the incumbent telecoms. Telecoms hate dig once. There is multiple legislations working through the state of Iowa right now that basically make it extremely difficult for counties to implement a good stewardish dig once policy. So I would implore you to be aware of that, try to get out in front of it. And, you know, if a federal dig once policy is even remotely possible, please pursue that. If not, maybe put in the guidance with this, some sort of promote dig once to help us get around that. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Nathan. Before you drop off, um, mm -hmm. I can answer this, but um, we have uh, someone messaged me and asked about uh, if you would define ARPA funds, please. So the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Act funds back from March of 2021, most counties got a sizable investment. Um, the final role that came out made the spending even more flexible. We are planning on spending several million of that to start our middle mile project and invest in it from our own general fund going forward to grow it over time. But realistically, I mean, it will take us 15 years to do it on the timetable that I'm working with right now. Whereas if we can use that as a match, and award this to this, we could greatly, greatly accelerate it. But a lot of federal grants don't allow federal money to be used for federal match. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's go to H. Buddy Robinson with uh, Leslie O'Shaughnessy on deck. Yes, I'm Harold Buddy Robinson. Uh, we're a site acquisition and uh, tire development company in Atlanta, Georgia. We have been installing and in site acquisition and developing towers in, in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and the northern part of, uh, of Florida and the Gulf Panhandle of Florida. And over the years, I have uh, installed cell towers in every about every county in these in these regions. Um, I have, I have extreme knowledge on all these dead zones that are um, within these county governments. And uh, there, there are just numerous areas where there's no 911 signals or um, emergency uh, connectivity in these dead zones. So my question is, uh, what are the mapping requirements for local county governments? And we're working with several local county governments in these states regarding wireless cell tower installations in dead zones uh, on these unserved and un, un, un rural counties of Georgia. I would like some of the mapping strategies that uh, we need to comply with the NTI guidance for accurate mapping. Uh, sometimes uh, the states show you uh, dead zones, but I think we need to get more exact as to where uh, the existing towers uh, are so that we can plan accordingly uh, to where the what to install uh, future infrastructure in these uh, dead zones that are uh, numerous in each of these rural counties in these in these states I just mentioned. The second question I have: What are the requirements and the criteria for the counties on submitting uh, the application uh, for these funds um, regarding the bead program? I'd like to see a clear. Uh, identification of the criteria that we need to comply with so that we, when we submit it to the state, we have um, covered the information that's required for review. And um, that's, that's really what I'd like to commend. I think the infrastructure installation is important in these dead zones so that future public safety um, 
programs would have an infrastructure to co-locate on, the broadband IPS systems would have an infrastructure to co-locate on, and there's just numerous wireless facility, uh, wireless phones. Uh, uh, connecting up these homes to fiber and internet are good, but also it's also good to have wireless phone connections in these unserved areas. So I look forward to uh, working with uh, NTIA and all the state governments that um, we're, we've been um, holding hands with over the over the years. Thank, thanks so much. And uh, just to be clear, I know that uh, you had a, a lot of comments in there. We will certainly <clears throat> take those comments. Um, but of course, this is uh, a listening session. So it's not a place where we could really answer questions, but I know that, that those questions are important for us to, to analyze. So th thank you so much, Mr. Robinson. Let's go to Leslie O'Shaughnessy um, with Lilibeth Gangas on deck. Hello, uh, my uh, comment, which is also a question is, you indicated that uh, the entities that would be eligible for this type of funding, including the uh, the tribal and technology companies and the PUCs and the communications companies for uh, for industry or uh, in a public private partnership grant application, if you will, uh, could you provide the clarity on how a uh, an industry partner can ap apply for this grant funds, particularly for middle mile that would establish connectivity to a rural area such as a tribal nation. Um, there was one comment that said uh, the may not exceed of 70% of the total cost, which is a, a specific criterion. I, I'd like to understand what the other criterion are uh, to be able to uh, build these middle mile areas that are already identified. Thanks so much. As I, as I said, unfortunately, we can't answer questions of course there will be a notice of funding opportunity that will come out for this right now today our goal is to get uh, comments from people um particularly about these questions although that you see up on the screen although of course um, people can can offer any comments that they want but um today we're, we're just not in position to answer the questions um and but understand that that even your questions um are, are are giving us a point of view. So thanks so much. Thank um, let's let's go to Lilibeth um, with Benny Lee on deck. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time in the comments. My name is Lily Genghis. I'm the Chief Tech Community Officer at the Caper Center, a private foundation where we are working to remove barriers specifically uh, for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities to enter the tech ecosystem um, and entrepreneurship and ultimately make it more diverse, inclusive, and impactful. As we know, we're in this digital first world. I'm also part of the Oakland Undivided group that has been a uh, coalition um, that it has come together since the beginning of the pandemic to help um, get 98% of our students here connected. And our goal is to continue to connect all of Oaklanders. And one of the key areas that I wanted to share for feedback, um, and, and, and I'll uplift what the first speaker mentioned that we definitely need better maps. First and foremost, there's a lot of uh, not only uh, low income urban areas, but also when you split it by demographics, racial makeup, income level, and then you also look at the speed test, we have communities out in East Oakland that are totally left behind, but yet are seen as connected. And so I, I wanna make sure that we are pushing forward for no more self-reporting by any of these ISP providers. We really, really need to have a clear sense of data of where we stand, be able to understand who is being serviced and who is not. And we need to have it at the zip code level as much as possible. I think the issue with having dark fiber uh, data be limited, it also creates additional um, rework um, and it prevents uh, us being able to build as we need to. Secondly, I wanna make sure that we're also uh, making sure that the funds are gonna be distributed as soon as possible. So then that way cities can also start to collect better data um, and making sure that we're not, um, being driven by false, false or just plain out underreported data by some of these ISP providers. So I want to make sure that that also takes place. And then lastly, this uh, accountability. Um, I think one of the speakers also earlier mentioned that we need to also take a look at the county level and city level as uh, the project. So who's being funded, how they're being measured. We want to make sure that there's accountability and transparency, specifically to make sure that 
cities like Oakland are not left behind because they're being also undercounted um, based on the erroneous maps. Um, also making sure that we're prioritizing high poverty areas that are substantially underserved where the rapid deployment is possible by funding Wi-Fi and making sure that we're also uh, looking at how to fund apartment Wi-Fi, for example. Um, so with that said, thank you so much for all the work that you do. And I'm looking forward um, to helping our communities and making sure that we're looking at this work with a racial justice, economic justice lens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Benny Lee. And after Benny, we'll go to Jerry Everett. Thank you. Uh, I handled the public Wi-Fi program for the County of San Mateo and was formerly a council member for the city of San Leandro. Uh, in the County of San Mateo, we have 1400 uh, public Wi-Fi access points uh, in our facilities, as well as shared use non-county facilities in partnership with underserved community institutions. Much of this presentation appears to cover increasing subscription base, but our public Wi-Fi is non-subscription based. So consideration on encouraging the non-subscription base is my focus. This moves to a greater degree uh, for public use and adoption in the much challenged, underserved, and unserved digitally divided communities. I'm also looking for allocation of a reasonable percentage of dark fiber resources for non-commercial government and public use to local governments from this funding. This is a model that was used in the city of San Leandro where a public-private partnership with a fiber provider allocated 10 to 20% of the dark fiber strands for this purpose. This is a good model that becomes the enabler for local government to increase digital access and adoption investments. This would encourage local government institutions to add public Wi-Fi access in underserved and unserved communities to cover gaps with non-subscription base to increase greater adoption in the digital divide. Your consideration on trying to push for this would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much um, to Jerry. Let's go to uh, Scott Turner and then SML Blarek. Yes, SML Bay, sorry. Yes, Jerry Everett from Big Rapids Township uh, in Michigan. It appears that we've got the mice guarding the cheese. There's the, the, an accurate representation of where we have and where we don't have coverage is uh, a guessing game at best. And I don't understand why we don't have an organization like NTIA deciding to take charge and say, all right, we're gonna have, we're gonna make sure that we've got accurate information so that our goals can be clearly identified and we can work in all that direction. I apologize for this just being a complaint because I don't have, I, I don't have a solution except somebody needs to take charge of actually giving us an honest representation of what is where, uh, because what we have now is pretty much useless. Thank you. Thank you so much, SM. We'll go to you and then followed by Scott Turner. Actually, um, we have Scott Turner next, and then SM will be after that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this forum. Uh, my name is Scott Turner, legislative political uh, campaign lead for Northern California Communication Workers of America, District 9. Also on the Broadband Brigade, we're doing uh, work to pass broadband legislation and make sure every American has broadband accessibility. One of the brothers spoke earlier about uh, the fiber running through communities to a specific destination, but they don't stop. So we can envision this as being like a, a freeway. You only got stops in the downtown areas. Who the heck's gonna drive on a freeway and not be able to jump off into their neighborhood? That's, that's nonsense. Um, just wanted to put that into start. And then I also just wanted to make these two points. The COVID-19 pandemic, it exposed the gaps in the broadband services. When the pandemic ends, the gaps are still going to be present. They're not gonna go away. So Americans need high-speed affordable broadband to work, to learn, to shop, succeed in the world today. However, millions of us do not have reliable affordable broadband access. And the second part of this piece is the broadband infrastructure law means universal access and affordability, corporate accountability, brothers and sisters spoke of that, broad public oversight and the creation of good union jobs. This law helps ensure that no child has to drop out of school due to lack of internet access, 
or that a senior citizen goes without medical care because they do not have affordable broadband. This law makes an enormous difference in the lives of millions of folks, especially those living in underserved communities. In order to succeed in America, everyone, and I'm gonna repeat that word, everyone needs to be on a level playing field. And that's what this law does. With these funds and with the broadband and the middle mile, everyone should have that equal opportunity to thrive in society, be safe and um, have a future present for themselves. Thank you guys for this forum. Thanks so much, Scott. Let's go to Essam and then we'll go to Brian Cornish. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Samuel Beck, uh, Web Sensing Illinois Century Network. Uh, I have a, a short comment based on your second listening question. Um, you know, if the, if the strategy of uh, an applicant is to build a middle mile network with uh, plenty of dog fiber available, uh, then it may be that uh, some existing middle mile fiber that's uh, available in, in the ground uh, with perhaps uh, uh, not uh, fiber available, uh, that that would uh, not be able to be leveraged. In other words, um, you know, the strategy is to build a uh, middle mile network with, with, with plenty of dark fiber available, uh, then there may be existing middle mile infrastructure uh, that is not available to be leveraged. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to comment. Terrific. Let's um, let's go to Brian, and then after Brian, we'll go to Lisa Sutherland. Brian Gornish, I'm on the director of Outside Plant for Kansas Fiber Network. I have a comment on all three of the listening session questions. So my um, comment on question one um, regarding requirements for splice points, access points, um, locations for interconnection to other providers. Um, I think that at minimum some guidance is required, um, but I think as you, as the NTIA looks at any requirements, just keep in mind that um, I think the middle mile proposals that you will receive, there'll be a mix of new construction, existing facilities, IRU facilities, and you can't apply the same standards across all aspects of a middle mile network. So say for instance, you know, if if somebody has a new middle mile project that they're requesting funding for and it includes some IRU fiber, um, they may not have the ability to change existing splice points or access locations on that IRU route. So just keep in mind, you know, that any cost effective middle mile solution is going to have a mix of how they get from point A to point Z and that any hard and fast requirements regarding splice points or interconnection points um, may not be doable with every construction methodology or facilities they use in that solution. Um, on no, number two, um, on how you can leverage existing facilities. Um, I heard someone mention dig once and and I think dig once is great. Um, and I know different municipalities, states have different requirements. Um, but I think the key on dig once is less of a mandate and more about um, information exchange and communication. Um, and and I'm not aware of any in my area, but but I think the the primary driver behind dig once is to make sure that all inter all interested parties have a chance to place facilities when whether it's a road project or even another another telecom project um and and to share and spread the cost on that and and so i think you know any dig once initiatives really need to focus on the communication efforts and coordination efforts um and then when you look at existing blocks you know there's the traditional you know ac access to poles um that i think most all parties deal with but i think a big one is um railroad crossings you know there's some states that have dressed and coming up with standardized intervals and formats to um do applications to railroads for crossings and public right-of-ways um, but that's definitely not um existing in every state but that is a big one you know for i know for 
all telecom providers um, across the country. So, um, and I guess my third one would be on what scalability requirements. And I think this kind of lends to my answer on the first one, you know, cause there's gonna be different, what's your definition of scalability? You know, if it's a solution that's gonna include IRU fiber, you know, it's gonna have limited scalability. And if it's a new build project or a greenfield project, um, if you have a requirement that says, okay, this middle mile project needs to have X number of fibers available from day one, uh, obviously there's a cost. Or if it says this new greenfield middle mile build, it needs to have X number of fibers and X number of conduits available for future use. Just keep in mind that all those have a cost, you know, and it, the more fiber you put in and the more conduits you add, it just increases the project cost. Okay, but thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. Um, let's go to Lisa Sutherland and we'll follow uh, Lisa with Aria Fishman. Hi, this is um, Lisa Sutherland. I'm with the Alaska Federation of Natives um, in Alaska. We serve about uh, 229 tribes um, and a number of other tribal organizations in the state. Uh, my first question is, I know that there was a deadline, I think it was last Friday, the 4th, to submit comments on um, a number of NTIA programs. Will there, after this uh, session, will there be an additional opportunity to submit ideas based on some of the information that different participants have su uh, suggested? That's my first question. Um, and then my second one is Broadband USA is, designed to be kind of the one-stop shop where everyone can go to find out what federal opportunities there are. I did want to mention that, you know, uh, USDA and, and others have opportunities too, that they have deadlines coming up, but a lot of the information is not up to date. Um, but apart from that, I think the thing that would be most helpful, I know a lot of our tribes spent $50,000, $100,000 or more putting together applications for the tribal broadband um, program, including middle, some middle mile applications. And I'm hopeful that you might, in as part of the middle mile NOFO that you put out, that you would allow these tribes and maybe others as well to take those applications. There's also tribal organizations that are allowed to apply, be allowed to put those applications into the middle mile portal without having to spend another 50 to hundred thousand dollars to put together a different application. Um, you know, obviously there there's possible, there might be some statutory requirements that were in the middle mile um, program that were not in the tribal broadband. And you'll have to have maybe an addendum that would be submitted, but I hope you'll consider that, you know, now tribes, because they, no decisions have been made on the tribal broadband grants. They're having to also submit applications for RUS who has a whole different application process. And so now if we have to do like a third application for the middle mile program, it just gets to be a lot, especially for tribes that don't have a lot of capacity. Um, so I'm hoping that you will, you know, maybe allow some reciprocity and ultimately, I think it would be good if the federal agencies could get together and create a one uniform application process. And maybe you can work with Congress. I think they would be open to doing that. Obviously, if you're doing a rural development application, it has to be on rural lands. But there's just so much overlap and so much money that's being spent on consultants and, and putting these applications together. And then the, my last uh, suggestion is that as you're kind of contemplating what your compliance requirements are going to be, that you work with the tribal broadband and some of the other programs so that people don't spend all their time doing compliance. Um, we've already seen that, in, especially with a lot of Indian tribes who don't have a lot of capacity. They're too busy filling out quarterly or even monthly reports for agencies. They don't have time to apply for the gr grants that are, are out there. So I hope that you'll have maybe for especially small and needy tribes, you might consider having a 
a reduced or a kind of a streamlined uh, uh, compliance process and compliance schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, on here that if you have comments um, that you would like to submit following this presentation and, and this session, feel free to send those to broadbandforall at ntia.gov. Again, that's broadbandforall at ntia.gov. Um, so with that, let's go to Aria Fishman and we'll follow, follow Aria with uh, George Kaloudis. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Aria Fishman and I represent the Edison Electric Institute, EEI, and we are the trade association that represents all of the U.S. investor-owned electric companies. Uh, just by way of introduction, I would point out that EEI's members own and operate a vast uh, overhead system including the utility poles. Uh, what we believe, particularly now referring to the second uh, question, is that electric companies such as the uh, investor-owned utilities can really have a big impact in terms of expediting mill-mile broadband infrastructure. They typically do have rights away, and they have a long history of working collaboratively with stakeholders, such as organized labor. And uh, electric companies could be in the solution uh, of providing middle mile broad and infrastructure on a non-discriminatory basis. So that would, uh, we believe, go a long way to presenting a cost-effective solution to communities. Uh, so we would encourage NTIA to, uh, I guess we'd be encouraging NTIA as well to encourage ISPs to enter into partnerships, uh, but we'd also uh, draw attention that it would be helpful to encourage the states um, to lower the barriers to be able to um, allow companies such as IOUs to uh, leverage their electric assets, their rights of ways, their poles for uses of broadband, not just electric use. So if they're not allowed to use those assets, it's not going to be part of the solution set. And that I think would be a big help if there was encouragement to the states to lower those barriers. Um, so that would be the comment I guess I'd like to offer, which is again, just to remind um, the NTIA as well that we were very pleased to be able to offer our comments and thoughts in your uh, in response to the RFC. And we look forward to hopefully being able to work with you all in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's go to George and then we will follow George with Susan C. George Kaloudis, are you there? Okay, let's go to this Susan is, this, C. This is, this is George Heckman. Uh, I think you're a little farther down, George. We're going to get okay. we're going to get to you. Uh, let's go to Susan C. And then after Susan C., we'll go to Perry Mulcrone. Susan. Susan, you're on mute if you're trying to speak. Last call for Susan, or we'll go to. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, my background is in public health science, Harvard School of Public Health, where I was a research assistant. And I just need to say that we, the primary thing that we need to look at, given the primary purposes of both the Communications Act and the Telecommunications Act, which our purpose, their very legislative purpose is to promote the safety of life and property, not just protect, but promote. We have now thousand some, 10, 000, or 11,000 some pages of evidence in the NTIA record and on federal court records, as well as in general, 25,000 some or more studies over the past century. This is a very well-established science Radio frequency radiation, microwave radiation, bioeffects is an established science. That's why we need to look at this elephant in the room primarily and above all. Okay, There can be no further wireless deployment, particularly not anything over 6,000 megahertz, 6 gigahertz, which we now know to be illegal 
per the court decision of uh, August 2021. But we can't build out any more wireless at all, period, knowing what we know and based on that law. Okay, the science, the facts, the laws are established. This is no mere matter of concern or, or any other groups across the country that may express their concern. No, this is a matter of fact and law. So I, by the way, as a person with Native and, uh, American ancestry, I totally agree with the Katua band that brought their lawsuit two years ago. And also with the earlier expression, the first expression from the Alaskan tribes. We need to focus on fiber and not wireless. Okay, because otherwise we're damaging people, we're damaging animals, insects, the environment. And as a scientist, I have to inform you that wireless facilities constitute what the military calls electronic weapons, EWs. Okay, and further, that we must lose all pollinators within a matter of just years if the build out continues. And even if what is already deployed continues to operate. And this is why we need to cease operations immediately of everything that's operating over six gigahertz, which is the law now, and cease these, and at least until FCC goes back and does its homework, which obviously it admitted in uh, the last law lawsuit before the DC circuit it had not done. So we need to prioritize life above all, and federal law tells us so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Um, let's go to uh, Perry Mulcrone and uh, we'll follow Perry with Rod Couch. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Perry Mulcrone. I uh, manage uh, Scott County's uh, fiber, uh, regional fiber network in, in Minnesota, just outside Minneapolis. Um, my comments are uh, more pragmatic. Uh, just uh, regard to number one, um, the, and and in respect to what the gentleman had said earlier about sometimes you won't be able to require uh, access points for other providers, but in order to sort of future proof this, uh, the stuff that goes into the uh, into is implemented <clears throat> for in regards to fiber, you may want to consider um, having the applicant demonstrate how they're going to allow other providers to connect to the middle mile. Um, at, but with his respect that he said, uh, you know, there's IRU fiber out there, they may not be able to contractually, but they can demonstrate that in the application process. Um, uh, also, uh, when we put in our fiber, we did uh, every 700 feet in the city, every 1500 feet outside, we found that concrete um, handholds are uh, hold up a lot longer than the um, polyfiber handholds. Um, you'd want uh, uh, every major intersection, so 700 feet or every major intersection to allow that, what the other gentleman had said, to allow jump off points. Um, and then uh, for future proofing also to try to, um, I know overbuild can be a, uh, a, a lightning word, but uh, the dig once concept where you put in larger conduit at the beginning and encourage uh, um, uh, maybe multiple conduits uh, instead of one and a quarter inch, maybe put in you know, two and a two and a half or three inch uh, conduit uh, and encourage those kind of um, uh, uh, statements in the application process. As far as uh, uh, number two is you could also consider in the application process giving priority where people can dem demonstrate, entities can demonstrate that they are gonna leverage existing um, infrastructure and existing middle mile. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, let's go to Rod Couch, and then uh, we'll get to uh, George Heckman. Rod? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Rod. Right, thank you. I was going to respond specifically to the questions. I work for Camo Electric Cooperative. We're a GNT in Northeast Oklahoma, and we, we have direct connectivity to uh, nine co-ops Northeast Oklahoma, as well as 10 plus tribal nations in the Northeast Oklahoma area. And so uh, our, our responses are directed towards being able to provide service to those. Um, for number one, should the NTI impose any federally fundamental mile projects with replacement or placement to splices? We think that you should only impose requirements for access to, to uh, points of presence uh, where our equipment and fiber are both 
located. Uh, requiring access to splice points can be detrimental to a, the integrity of a network as it will cause a network to have stranded assets and providing a, what we call chopped up, but providing access to splice points in different areas. Uh, so the con you know, continuity of the network is degraded. When you require access at the POPs, uh, system integrity is maintained by that system owner. And especially when the owner has ex the, an existing system and their funding uh, requests are for improvement to that system to help provide additional bandwidth to area of fiber to the home providers, utilities, and tribal areas. Uh, how can middle mile infrastructure uh, program leverage existing middle mile facilities? Uh, we believe that the rural electric cooperatives are the perfect example of non-traditional providers that have uh, the ability to leverage their existing middle mile facilities. They have access to the right of ways, the poles, the conduits, and other infrastructure uh, to provide the fiber to the home services in the areas of the left abandoned by the large communication companies. We think for guidance, NTIA should convene a panel made up of the leaders of cooperatives and other companies where the deployment of the fiber to home successes have been established and recognized. In addition, we uh, uh, believe obtaining easements is a major concern and cost factor for deploying the middle mile network. We believe that should be addressed. And as the network grows, uh, capacity needs in the middle mile network uh, should grow as well. We believe that the grant recipients should be building networks capable of supporting 100 gigabit per second and higher bandwidth services. Uh, these networks are a fiber-based network. Uh, DWDM is also necessary to meet those requirements. So that's my uh, input for the answers that y'all uh, had asked on the uh, presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Rod. Let's go to George Heckman, and then uh, George will be followed by Odette Wilkins. George, I know we had you earlier. So. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, I want to comment uh, particularly on uh, number two. Um, well, I'm George Heckman. I'm the principal of Heckman Venture Development, and we work with a variety of uh, communities and uh, private companies on addressing some of these issues. And specifically, um, we've we run into situations where there is existing uh, fiber backbone networks uh, to serve uh, research and educational uh, networks in states where there could be fiber to every library, uh, every school, every university, uh, and other such anchor institutions, but they are prohibited um, by law uh, from competing with private ISPs. And uh, we would encourage uh, that to be a requirement uh, of NTIA that if such a laws are in place uh, prohibiting the use of that uh, that fiber to reach uh, private uh, individuals uh, that that uh, that barrier be removed i think as we commented on the last uh, session uh, the incumbent uh, isps have failed uh, sometimes just for economic reasons not by bad intentions uh, to provide service to these areas where a solution may already be underground passing by uh, neighborhoods on the way uh, to uh, the school or other anchor institutions. So I think that's a very important point, uh, number two, because there's a lot of opportunity there in many states uh, in the country. Uh, speaking back to, for instance, the folks in uh, San Mateo and Oakland, uh, two areas that I know uh, well, uh, Scenic, C-E-N-I-C, is uh, running the Golden State Network. They run the CalRen Network. They've been provided $3 billion uh, from the state of California, and I'm sure we'll be involved in this. They're, we're working with uh, them on solving exactly that uh, type of issue to leverage that existing uh, infrastructure. In some states, again, like California, uh, the uh, Public Utility Commission, by the way, is uh, gathering some of this connectivity uh, information by census tract, not just uh, zip code. Uh, and uh, I think that that uh, should be taken into account uh, if the state has uh, instituted that type of uh, fact-finding uh, information in its application. Thank you. Thanks so much, George. Um, 
Now let's go to Odette Wilkins. And uh, Odette, we're going to follow you with uh, Louis Parade. Uh, let me make sure Parades. Thank you very much. I'm Odette Wilkins, and I head up um, an advocacy group called Wired Broadband, and we are promoting fiber optics to the premises, not wireless, but fiber optics to the premises. What I want to do is I want to address the issue of reducing regulatory and permitting barriers to promote the construction of new middle mile. Well, first of all, uh, middle mile has already been built and maybe even overbuilt. I think what we're really looking for is access to the nodes so that local fiber operators can actually construct fiber to the premises. So we're looking for those nodes. And what's, you know, we're talking about reducing regulatory and permitting barriers. That's not what should be reduced. Those are mischaracterized as barriers. They are not. They protect the residents' health and welfare, and they give them a right to be heard. And it also protects the local fiber operators to also have a right to be heard. What's being erected, what's, it, they're being used as a euphemism to erect barriers against residents to take away their right to hearings and their right to be heard. And it's a barrier to entry for local fiber operators to provide fiber to the premises. Now, residents are being exposed to wireless radiation that they don't want or need. Wireless nodes facing their homes and into their children's bedrooms. For instance, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires, there have been about 17 individuals or families who have had to evacuate their homes after a wireless tower was placed at the end of their block because they can't live there anymore. It's a toxic zone. And they are trying desperately for the past two years to get back to their homes. So that is a problem, and, the, and by reducing the regulatory and permitting per, uh, barriers, they were not given the right to be heard, and they were not given the right of consent. And now they've had to be refugees out of their own homes. That is not okay. That is not what bridging the digital divide is about, not forcing people out of their homes. Also, the NTIA really should give priority to fiber. When we talk about broadband, it's fiber, not wireless. Wireless is things from that move. Fiber to the premises is what is affordable, what is scalable, what is a superior service. What's, it's it, these regulatory and permitting barriers that need to be reduced. Well, that's being used as a barrier to a more superior service, and that's fiber. Because what's being done is they're using those, uh, uh, they're saying that those are barriers because they're trying to force everyone to accept wireless, which is an inferior service. Former FCC Chair Tom Wheeler calls fiber future-proof and wireless only as a last resort, not a first resort. Fiber is a superior service. It's, it's scalable from 100 megabits per second to 1 gigabit per second, 10 gigabits per second. Wireless doesn't even come close. Fiber is safe. It's cyber secure compared to wireless, which is hazardous to our health and to trees and to pollinating insects. And the list goes on and on. I mean, just look in the FCC docket. Um, Susan C. talked about this. The DC Circuit Court of Appeals remanded back to the FCC back in August of last year to reconsider its emission limit, limits from 1996. The FCC violated the Administrative Procedures Act when they refused to consider the thousands of scientific studies of biological hazards of wireless radiation and the hundreds of personal accounts of injuries from wireless radiation. So what the NTIA, what I would suggest, uh, needs to require from the grant seekers is, first of all, any entity that previously received government grants has to account for those grants that they received and whether they achieved the results. If they have not, they're not able to do that, they would be automatically disqualified. Um, the barrier is here is the barrier to entry by the incumbents who are running middle mile fiber past rural communities without serving them, hence the digital divide. They created the digital divide. The way to handle the digital divide is to um, is to require them to make those nodes in the middle mile available for local fiber operators who can take care of the digital divide. So that is, uh, that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Odette. Um, let's go to Louis and um, follow, uh, we'll follow that with uh, Paul Nero. And um, we've just got a few minutes left, so appreciate everybody adhering to the time rules. Okay, can you, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Thank you so much for holding these listening sessions. And thank you for all the hard work that the NTIA staff is doing to implement um, 
this robust program. Um, I want to say a couple of things. I want to talk about the uh, rights away um, questions that you have in, in, in question two. Section 224F of the Communications Act of 1934 grants rights to cable television systems and telecommunication carriers to access poles, ducts, conduits, and rights away, but it does not extend those same rights to standalone broadband providers or bra broadband providers that are offering interconnected VoIP. To the extent that it is within NTIA's authority, state and local governments should expedite approvals for access to polls, ducts, conduits, and rights away. We think that will go a great uh, way towards expediting deployment of middle mile. And then also, uh, I, the, uh, the IIJA mandates that uh, NTIA must implement this middle mile uh, grant program in a technology neutral manner. That means that the uh, NTIA should give fixed wireless providers uh, uh, a fair opportunity for these grants as it's giving to fiber. I, I represent WISPA. It's a, an association that represents more than 700 fixed wireless providers. And our members are using both fixed wireless, fiber, and in many cases, hybrid networks in order to um, build more broadband and, and bridge digital divides. And I also wanna say one last point to those folks, such as the last speaker, um, that is uh, uh, continue to misconstrue the DC Circuit's opinion um, from August, 2021. The DC Circuit remanded to the FCC that it would take a careful look at some of the scientific studies because it did not provide an adequate explanation the DC Circuit did not say that anything that was currently being um, uh, implemented or deployed by wireless or fixed wireless networks was illegal, um, contrary to some of the um, speaker's remarks. And nor all it did, and the DC Circuit did not even grant the request of the environmental um, parties to vacate the order or vacate the, uh, the FCC's rules. All it did was ask the FCC to further explain its, its reasoning. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Um, let's go to Paul and then to Josh Snow. Paul, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Paul Naro, Naro. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah, my name is Paul Nara. Um, so for the for the number for the first one, the question, uh, NTI should NTI should require uh, splices points at least every seven hundred feet and at every intersection for the middle mile projects. And then on number two, to accelerate the deployment of high speed broadband services, NTI should require applicants to uh, have ETC status similar to, to RDOF. Um, I think that worked very well because that gives them uh, the right of way so there, there's no delays in deployment. And then for number three, NTIA should require um, no, a minimum of 240 strands of fiber deployment to allow for future growth and um, also multiple uh, conduits to allow for uh, future growth. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, Josh Snow. Yes, Josh Snow, President of Trace Fiber Networks in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, we are a current uh, BTOP, um, uh, I guess I'm not recipient, but we are using IRU fibers out of the BTOP, some of the BTOP grant that came uh, back in 2009. Uh, OCAN is the provider here. And so, so we have, I have a pretty, pretty, work, pretty good working knowledge of, of being able to access those uh, available strands and duct that was was installed, um, so that's certainly a, a good thing. What I would make comment is is that there needs to be uh, access points along the way. Not every handhold uh, should be an access point. Um, there, th those need to be determined uh, when the staking sheets and the routes are are, are being developed, <clears throat> but they do need to be. Uh, uh, that, that forethought needs to be put into that. I think where we can better that um, procedure today is, is to come up with some sort of um, 
inventive way to access those uh, records because one of the things that is a little bit cumbersome now is, is that it's a very manual process to find out uh, what available, uh, what the availability is of the strands that are at those access points. So some sort of real-time database uh, that correlates with a map that shows that this route is available and it's available for uh, joint use and IRU use and what the uh, availability is on the dark strands. As it pertains to the cost, um, you know, we can get, you know, into a long discussion about, you know, the varieties of the cost uh, to build, whether it's underground or, or, or aerial, but there needs to be some sort of mechanism in place that that the cost per strand per mile is standardized uh, so that, that all parties uh, can participate at a fair and equitable rate. Um, and as it goes to being able to make uh, it accessible, I do agree with some of the other comments that have been made. If it is going to be a buried uh, system that the minimum of three inch and a quarter, inch and a half HTP, HTP poly uh, ducts uh, should be uh, put in the ground and that they would <clears throat> be made connected to uh, points of presence that have access to uh, tier one uh, internet drains so that those areas are actually connecting um, to something that will get them to, you know, uh, lower cost per meg uh, internet drains. So with that, I will, uh, we'll close. Thanks so much, um, Josh. You've got the last word because we're one minute over. Um, I wanna thank everybody for attending today. We certainly appreciate and welcome your feedback. Um, to remind everyone once again, if you want to provide additional feedback, if you've got um, some more questions, please uh, send those to broadband for all at ntia.gov. Um, this has been our fourth broadband uh, program public virtual listening session. We've got a fifth coming up on February 23rd, 2022. You have the website there that you can see for upcoming listening sessions. Thanks to everyone. We uh, appreciate your feedback. Uh, and uh, we look forward to our success with our middle mile program. Thank you.